Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, first of all, can you hear me in the back? Mic all working? Okay, excellent. So I'm excited to be here. Again, Colonel Ben Bishop. Uh, I'm the commander of the 354th Fighter Wing here at Isleson. Uh, and I'm really passionate about uh, uh, Isleson and about the mission. Uh, and I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. So I got slides, I got a, a brief uh, presentation I can give. But if you have questions as we're going along, free, feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll, I'm happy to make this a conversation. Or if you want to wait till the end, we'll, we'll have opportunity for that uh, as well. Uh, but I want to start with a little uh, adage or maybe a joke. Uh, so you know a conversation with a fighter pilot is halfway complete when you hear, hear the sentence, okay, enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about my airplane. <laughs> right? So I actually want to structure my talk about that. Not necessarily about me, but really about Ielson and what Ielson does, what our mission is, and why I'm so passionate about our airmen and what we do and our impact to the community, but also to the geopolitical environment. Uh, and then also, I want to take some time to talk about the F-35. We talked, uh, talked about it arriving. I'm really excited about it. I'm a former F-35 pilot, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that experience uh, and just about what it means for that capability to come here and be integrated in the community. So we got a picture up there uh, that was taken at our air show. Uh, Arctic Lightning, anyone make it to Arctic Lightning? Yeah, so uh, there you go. You got the F-35, like, uh, was actually here in the skies of Alaska with an F-16. Uh, and that F-16 is actually from Isleson, uh, from the 18th Aggressor Squadron. Uh, and as you look at the 354th Fighter Wing uh, at Isleson, those are the two aircraft that we're going to have here uh, real soon. Uh, so with that, let's get on to it and talk about me. <laughs> Slide. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, I'm Ben. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my family and I. It was taken over just about over a year ago as we were driving up from my previous assignment. Uh, down at Luke Air Force Base. Uh, I was the operations group commander, which means I was in charge of all the flying, all the pilots. Uh, I had 140 aircraft uh, under my command. I was also an F-35 pilot. But for us coming up here, it was an opportunity of a lifetime. We're really excited. We actually went out and got an RV. This, that picture is taken uh, uh, in Banff, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, we went up to, to Jasper. So that's my wife, Erin, uh, and I. And I, I got uh, Claire. Uh, she was two, now she's three uh, on my back there. Uh, my five-year-old Ethan and seven-year-old Bud and then nine-year-old uh, Amelia. Uh, and they love being, being up here in Alaska. Uh, it's busy <laughs> uh, with a family like that. And we always say uh, there's, you know, all joy, no peace in the Bishop household, if you will. <laughs> uh, but that's us. We're really excited to be here uh, and really excited to be uh, part of Alaska. But another great thing is, you know, the job I get to have. Uh, so I alluded to already, I was an F-35 pilot. That picture was taken uh, of me when I was a squadron commander uh, down at uh, Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, so my career actually started back in 1997. Uh, I went to uh, uh, Purdue University, graduated, got my commission. My first job was to go off to school and get a master's degree in space operations. Uh, after that, uh, I went to pilot training. Uh, I had my first operational assignment flying F-15Es, Strike Eagles, uh, stationed at Lake and Heath. Uh, I was uh, stationed in the States in Seymour Johnson teaching and then I did two assignments at Nellis where that picture was taken, doing F-15E training and then eventually transitioning to the F-35. I alluded to my previous assignment uh, uh, down at Phoenix uh, before coming up here and then I relieved, uh, I did um, several years in school. Uh, so uh, I've either been flying airplanes and leading or, 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 uh, or learning, which is, you know, passions of mine. Uh, so my wife does tell me I have a problem because I have, like to collect degrees. I love the university environment. I love classroom settings and, uh, and teaching and conversations. So it's one of the reasons I'm uh, really excited about being here today. I've got a Twitter account, uh, so feel free to follow me uh, on that and really have conversations in the, uh, that social media space there. Um, so that's who I am, and this is where I work. And I love starting with this picture because I think everyone here that lives in Alaska understands this. But when I talk to people that are from the continental United States, uh, they think of, a, of Alaska and the map of Alaska, and it's always, you know, the state's always in the corner, right? Uh, upper left or bottom left, uh, out, you know, kind of out of the way, out of, out of thought, out of mind. But if you, yeah, if you look at our location, though, especially as an airman looks at the world, we're in the center of everything. Uh, so you see the, the lines there, um, I'll kind of point them out here. They're blue lines, which means they're less than about 4,600 miles. And what that means to me as a fighter pilot 
is I can get somewhere in a single sortie in a fighter aircraft, as long as I have tanker support. So that means if I get in a fighter, I can be anywhere in Europe or the Pacific in one sortie. If I'm stationed down here in the CONUS, it's not really a, an option. So this is a very strategic location. In fact, uh, if you've ever heard the name Billy Mitchell, General Mitchell, he was one of our air, uh, air power pioneers uh, in the 20s. And actually, when he was testifying in Congress in 1935, he said, Alaska is the most central place in the world for air operations. And he went on to testify, said, whoever holds Alaska holds the world because of that. So it's a very strategic location, uh, and we as airmen realize that, and I think a lot of the people in this room realize that as well. Speaking of strategy, uh, last year there was a change in our national strategy when you turn, look at the Department of Defense. Uh, so Secretary Mattis at the time, uh, Secretary of Defense published this document. You can actually Google it, it's unclassified. It's the National Defense Strategy uh, in 2018. It's still our National Defense Strategy. Uh, and it really talks about how the last two decades we've been kind of in an era of strategic atrophy. We've been really focused on our capabilities in the Middle East, really focused on you know, a threat as we use that term, uh, th uh, that term in the military, you know, countries that can you know, bring military might against us. We've been focusing on kind of that lower end. Uh, and he talks about the importance of preparing for the next fight, looking ahead and look at that battle space of tomorrow and being prepared for that environment. Because he calls it out in the National Defense Strategy that there are revisionist powers that are looking to rewrite the international order according to their values and not our values uh, as, as Americans. And the best way to offset that is with a quote here. It's a more lethal force, strong alliances and partnerships, American technological innovation and a culture of performance. So the National Defense Strategy actually lays out lines of effort. And the first line of effort is build that more lethal force. Second line of effort is strengthening our alliances and attract new partners. And you heard a little bit about the red flag exercise that's going on right now. Operation Red Flag is the large force exercise that brings countries from all over the world to train here in the skies of Alaska to be more lethal force and to strengthen our interoperability and alliances. It's our national defense strategy in action. So it's really exciting as a wing commander, I can talk to everyone in my organization and say, you are supporting not just our, uh, our mission here, but our national defense strategy. And leaders recognize it. And they come here to hear that story and also to see the national defense strategy in action. So I had Assistant Secretary of Defense for Readiness, who's a four-star military equivalent. She was here for three days this last week uh, to see Red Flag. A year ago, our Secretary of the Air Force came here to. Uh, uh, to Eielson and uh, interacted with the community with two, two events. Uh, there's other uh, four stars. General Raymond, who's the uh, commander of US, U.S. Space Command, uh, was here two weeks ago. Um, Lieutenant General Berger, who's going to be the next commandant of the Marine Corps, was uh, here. Before. So uh, I do a lot of, <laughs> a lot of visits, uh, and that's a good thing because it allows us to tell the story to, uh, to decision makers and uh, leaders. So it's exciting to, to have a, a mission that is Jeff, uh, uh, directly linked to that higher level of, uh, of strategy. Speaking of uh, our, our wing and our mission, this is what we do. This is why we exist. And in, uh, uh, our first mission is to prepare U.S. and partner forces for 21st century combat. Again, that's that battle space of tomorrow. Uh, that's that red flag training mission. And if you know a, a little history of uh, Eielson, uh, back in the early 2000s, we had a combat mission. Uh, we had a combat squadron of A-10s and a combat squadron of F-16s there. Uh, the A-10s went away and the F-16s transitioned to that training mission for that red flag uh, and, uh, uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, we've had that for over a decade. But now we're adding on a new mission where we project and integrate air power in support of world out operations. So we're bringing two F-35 combat squadrons on. Uh, however, we're not taking anything off our plate. And so a lot of times with F-35s come to a base, uh, a squadron deactivates and that F-35 squadron comes in. Uh, so it's kind of a replacement. Well, here at Eielson, it's 100% additive. So the 
we're keeping everything on the plate, the plate is just getting bigger and there's going to be more people uh, and, and more admission coming. So it's really ex an exciting time of growth uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the wing. Speaking of growth, that's really what our vision is all about. An elite team of pioneering airmen forging air powers a frontier through world-class training in readiness for 20 cent 21st century combat. So we kind of boil it down to prepare, project, and pioneer. Uh, so pioneer is big for us because we're on Alaska, <laughs> uh, on Alaska frontier. Uh, we're pioneers in that, uh, in that respect, but also our 354th fighter wing heritage, this patch I wear on my shoulder, uh, actually goes back to World War II uh, when the 354th fighter group activated and stood up. <laughs> Uh, they trained on P-39s, very old aircraft uh, in the continental United States. They went to England, and that team was chosen as the first unit to fly the P-51 Mustang in combat. Uh, and we were known as the Pioneer Mustang Group, uh, and that's the, our lineage. Uh, so it was a lot of pioneering, uh, a lot of new technology. And what's great about that story is the airmen and the maintainers had two weeks to figure out how to fly this aircraft, that P-51 and then they were out in the skies shooting down Nazis over the, uh, over the skies of Europe. And they went on to be the highest scoring uh, unit uh, of the European theater in the war. So it's uh, a lot of heritage connected to now because that story is very relevant as we bring in the F-35 to, uh, to the skies of Alaska, we're again pioneering that, uh, that future there. Uh, so with that, speaking of aircraft, this is uh, the aircraft we have at Eielson today. Uh, so I neglected to mention earlier, but we have a Air National Guard wing, uh, the 168th, and they have nine, uh, uh, nine tankers, and these are our F-16s uh, that are stationed there. Uh, so again, that's that F-16 that does the aggressor or the training, uh, training mission for Red Flag. So in April of 2020, it changes, where we have F-35s on the ramp, uh, and it really becomes a big difference at the end of 2022. <laughs> <laughs> That's the number of aircraft we'll have. Oh, really? Yes. So it's more than double in size uh, of the mission. Uh, so that's a significant increase. Uh, and so uh, as far as the fighters, it's, uh, we use the term primary assigned aircraft. Uh, we have an acronym for everything in the Air Force, right? So uh, that's PAA. Uh, so we're funded for um, 24 PAA uh, for each squadron. That's actually 27 uh, aircraft total. Uh, but we're going to have 66 PAA uh, at the end of 2022. Uh, in the early 2000s, we had 36 PAA, or really 36 aircraft, when we had the A-10s and F-16s here. Uh, so the squadrons are, are, are much bigger. Huge expansion in, uh, in mission. But in addition to the aircraft, we have the people coming in as well. Uh, so this is our current population, about 11,000 when you look at the whole uh, uh, the whole base and the, commu uh, the community at Eielson, uh, about 1,764 active duty uh, right now here. But as, you, as those aircraft come in, we're getting about double that size uh, in terms of people. Uh, so if you add it up, it's about 14,300. Uh, so it's a significant increase, uh, about you know, close to 50% for the entire community and almost double on the active duty uh, member side. Um, so what that impacts is not just the base, but also the entire community. Uh, so this is a slide that's taken out of our Eielson Regional Growth Plan. Uh, I actually have a copy of it right here. It's a very thin document, as you can see. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a great study of uh, the economic impact and also the community impact that this is growth is going to have. Uh, and what this slide shows is, you know, this line right here is the, the um, total expected population going out to 2030. Uh, the red is the number of airmen, added airmen that we'll have at Eielson. And then the blue is that induced growth, because there's more people here, there's going to be more services that are needed, et cetera. Uh, so we're looking at about 5.4% uh, growth for the entire borough uh, based on the, uh, the Eielson. So uh, that, that Eielson growth. So it's an exciting time to be here. There's obviously going to be an economic impact with that growth. Uh, so currently, based on fiscal year 18, so our fiscal year goes from October to October. Uh, so this is October 2017 to October 2018. Our economic impact was 600, or 562 million, as you see there. Uh, the previous year, fiscal year 17, was 480 million. So it went up significantly just in that one year. 
to put that in perspective, uh, I did some research, and when Minneapolis hosted the Super Bowl, that brought in about $380 million of economic um, uh, impacts to the community. So I always say Ileson is like having almost two Super Bowls at, uh, at Fairbanks a year, uh, just in terms of that uh, impact. As far as the projected changes, uh, that no, those numbers are only going to go up. Uh, so the 26.7 and O and M or operations and maintenance, uh, operations and maintenance budget, uh, and then uh, payroll increase. But there's going to be a lot of other induced uh, growth there. Uh, so we're going to keep uh, a lot of track on that, or, or close tabs on that uh, that impact. The other thing I uh, like to talk about is as we as the regional growth plan does a good job discussing is whenever you have change, you know as humans that's hard. Uh, whenever you have change in a community, that's hard and it takes work. Uh, so there are some areas of uh, concern. Uh, for example, where are these airmen and their families going to live? You know, what's our housing situation going to be? Uh, because on base, we're not building any more houses. Uh, so we have a five-year fiscal defense plan that goes out for military construction, and there's nothing in that five-year plan uh, for housing. So all those airmen and their families are going to have to live off base. And about 85% of them are going to target that Fairbanks uh, um, excuse me, the uh, North Star, um, excuse me, the uh, North Pole, thank you, uh, in, within the uh, Fairbanks uh, North Star Borough. So they're going to want to live, you know, in the mayor's community, either in North Pole or, uh, or Sadger or Salcha and uh, Badger Lane. So um, that's kind of where we're targeting in terms of where that community growth can best, uh, uh, best happen. Uh, and we're really interested in, you know, having conversations with the community so I can communicate what demand signal there will be, what kind of airmen, what kind of demographics. Uh, do we need single family homes? Do we need apartments? Do we need rentals? Uh, in order to have that conversation, in order to kind of smooth that, uh, that growth. Another concern we have is medical care. Uh, so uh, Lieutenant General uh, uh, Place, uh, excuse me, Major General Place, he's a two-star general. He's in charge of the Defense Health Agency, he was just here on Monday, actually, uh, to talk about our medical needs as that community grows in terms of uh, specialty care, in terms of how many active duty uh, members will come in order to augment the medical group, uh, in order to make sure that uh, support network is uh, uh, in place as well. And then one of the other concerns I have is just the people, having quality people to fill the jobs that are gonna be uh, needed on base. Uh, so we have a large civilian and contract population, uh, and that is going to grow. Uh, for example, we're adding uh, over 100 civilian uh, government employee jobs. And traditionally at Ileson, a lot of those positions have gone vacant. So 20, 25 percent uh, vacancy rate. So we're really trying to bring that down, especially as our community grows. If we have uh, fewer employees or we don't have the right employees, then that's just going to make it harder for our airmen uh, because they'll have, they'll have to pick up all, all that work. So I put a plug in there www.ilesonjobs.com. <laughs> uh, so we have a website. If you know of anyone that's looking for a job or would like to join the Ileson team, uh, we're looking for, uh, for people to, uh, to bring on to the, uh, to the workforce and be part of that, uh, 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 that Ileson family. Uh, so I alluded to the uh, Regional Growth Plan. It's a great document. You can find it uh, online, uh, and it really provides good insight into a lot of that community growth. And really the bottom line is that's why I'm so passionate about partnering with the community uh, is because in order for us to do our job uh, in the Air Force, especially at Ileson, I need the support from the community uh, because uh, airmen that have good places to live, good schools for their kids and jobs for their spouses are going to be more ready and more effective and more engaged with the mission uh, when they have to do the job that our country uh, asks of them. Uh, so uh, I use the term uh, uh, that our community support directly links to readiness and then implementing our national defense strategy. Uh, so the people in this room are part of that mission and part of making it happen, uh, which is why, again, this is such a, a unique position to be in for me and why, why I'm so uh, passionate about the, uh, uh, the job. Uh, so with that, enough about me and <laughs> Ileson. <laughs> Let's talk about my airplane. <laughs> what do you do with 54 F-35s? Yes, sir, you do. You fly them. Right over my house. Yeah, that's right. 
And the flying is phenomenal. Uh, and I really want to talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the capabilities uh, of the F-35. Um, so this is my office, as I, as I like to say. Um, so I fly F-16s now, so, uh, since I'm stationed here at Eielson. Uh, and this is the cockpit uh, that I flew in. So I've been flying in Red Flag. I flew Monday, I flew Tuesday uh, as well. Uh, I went to refuel from our uh, tankers from the 168th wing here at Eielson. On Monday I refueled twice. Uh, on Tuesday I refueled thir three times. Um, <coughs> uh, but this is the cockpit that uh, I had. And it's very similar to my cockpit I had in, uh, I flew uh, in the F-15E, the Strike Eagle. Um, what you'll see here is you have a heads-up display. Uh, so that's basically a piece of glass that sits right in front of me, and that shows me information. Uh, we call it a HUD. Again, we have acronyms for everything. Uh, so we have a HUD that helps you look out and you know, uh, get uh, visual on other aircraft and really gives you real-time targeting information. And then down here, we have some scopes. Uh, we have a radar scope here, and then this is a, uh, a tactical situation display. Uh, and uh, you see a lot of kind of round gauges here, um, instrument gauges. Uh, I'm sure there's some private pilots uh, in the uh, audience here. Uh, very similar to what you'd see in, you know, a Super Cub or, you know, a Cessna aircraft. You know, basic instrument flying. What's the one on the left, the round one on the left? What's that? This one right here? That is the uh, airspeed. So right now, that's uh, 400 knots, 390 knots, uh, which is fairly, uh, fairly normal uh, for just kind of tooling around in the uh, F-16. This is our kind of like our radio uh, information. This is my standby attitude uh, indicator. This is my radar warning receiver. So when somebody is putting radar energy on the aircraft, I can kind of detect it. But you will see it's all, all these different sensors. Uh, and our F-16 pilots are really well trained, and I'm really well trained. And when I was an F-15E pilot, I was well trained, and I can do sensor management really good. Uh, but it's all done in my head. I'm taking the uh, information from the radar scope, I'm taking the information from our, our RWR, as we call it, radar warning receiver, again, an acronym. Uh, I'm looking at the HUD, and I'm building this three-dimensional picture you know, in my head. We call it situational awareness, uh, or SA to use kind of a pilot term. So you get really good at building SA and using the radar to, to target. But it's all about s emphasis on sensor management. Where is my radar looking? Uh, how am I detecting uh, other aircraft targeting me uh, and, and doing that? And it's, it's very effective, like I said. It's, uh, you know, F-16 is a great airplane, maneuvers well, was designed um, very well, but it was also designed, designed in the late 70s. Now compare that to an F-35 cockpit, which I flew uh, down at Luke. You'll see there's not a lot of these round dials. In fact, there's none. <laughs> uh, you have the same instrument display. This is a standby attitude indicator. Uh, there's a few knobs and switches here. Uh, but what you don't see on the sides of the F-16, there's just switches all over the place. Um, and there's lots of things I have to turn around and, and change in order to, uh, to manage the aircraft. Uh, what you'll see in an F-35 cockpit, there's no switches at all. It's very, very clean. It's only about like seven or eight. <laughs> You know, one of them is the uh, on and off switch for the engine, uh, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, starting the F-16, it's like all these uh, things I have to do when I uh, flew the F-35. I just went, clicked it on, and that was about it. Oh um, so it's very, very automated. The other thing is, you see these two displays here. Those are like two iPads. They're actually touch screens. Um, and that's where all your information is displayed. And the thing is, is I don't run a radar when I'm flying the F-35. The airplane actually does that. And it manages all the sensor information for you. And it builds a three-dimensional picture and actually shows it to you on your iPad. So the great thing about flying an F-35 is you don't have to worry about managing sensors or spending all that time. You can actually go one level up. And you can emphasize on managing the battle space. So I will say flying the F-35, I knew it was around me all the time. Like, I have to fight and work hard to get that same level of situational awareness flying the F-16, and I can't get there. Um, and that's just because of the sensors are so much better in the F-35, and you have that sensor fusion when it brings it all together. Um, and that's a really big part of a fifth generation aircraft. If you're familiar with the term fifth generation aircraft, uh, is like the F-35. Uh, it's kind of the five, or fifth evolution that we've had uh, in aircraft design, going all the way back to you know, uh, generation one uh, was a World War I aircraft. 
uh, Generation 2 was World War II, and then 3 was Korea, 4 was kind of Vietnam and F-16s uh, era. Um, so it is really a, a, a monumental leap in technology and capability. The other thing that you'll see is there's actually no HUD in the F-35. Uh, it's not there. And the reason why is because they have it in your helmet. So you can get all the information to, by just looking around. Uh, and uh, I will say I was you know, fighting uh, aircraft on Tuesday, uh, and one of them I had a radar lock over here, but I couldn't actually see them. Uh, I was trying to get that visual. Uh, if I have a helmet, I can actually, I'll know exactly where to look. Uh, so the F-35 fuses all that information, displays it on those two iPads, and actually displays it on your, uh, your helmet-mounted uh, display system as well. They are expensive. Uh, helmets, uh, the F-35 is an expensive piece of machinery. That helmet is expensive too, but that's also part of the avionics. It's part of the aircraft system, uh, and it's part of uh, uh, integrated into the, uh, uh, the whole maintenance of the, uh, uh, of the jet. But it is pretty cool. Uh, the, the, air, the F-35 also has infrared sensors, has six cameras all around the, uh, uh, the airplane, so it detects any heat source. So if somebody's shooting a missile at you, it will actually detect that. Uh, also, it's kind of like a night vision device where you can actually see the ground at night. And one of the cool things is, is that you can actually superimpose that image on your helmet and actually see the thermal image to the point where you can actually look down and see through the bottom of the aircraft. So, oh yeah, so it's, uh, they call it the Wonder Woman effect. <laughs> if you know Wonder Woman, the invisible, air, the invisible airplane, so you can actually look down and, uh, and see it. Uh, so. It is, uh, uh, it is a pretty fascinating uh, uh, capability. Uh, the other capability is it has all these sensors, advanced sensors, in a stealth aircraft. And I want to talk just a little bit about what stealth means um, and what it doesn't mean. Um, so a stealth airplane doesn't mean that you can't see it or that's invisible. It just means that radars uh, can't see it as easily. Uh, so what that really means is these red circles uh, red is bad, right? When you look at uh, uh, surface-to-air missile systems, these are the surface-to-air missile systems that might want to shoot down a, an aircraft. Uh, if you don't have a stealth uh, aircraft, basically those surface-to-air missile systems can see you in a long way out, and that means they can shoot you a long way out. What stealth technology does is it uh, reduces uh, that uh, detection range uh, for those surface-to-air missile systems. So it turns those big threat, threat rings, as we call them, into smaller threat rings. So what that impacts, when you look at operations, uh, if you have fourth generation aircraft and you're trying to get to a target area uh, in order to strike uh, or hold, hold the target at risk uh, and it's defended by surface air missile systems, uh, what you have to do is you have to put large force packaging to, uh, together. Uh, you have to put suppression of enemy air defenses together in order to kind of kick down the door, as we say, in order to bring down those enemy air defenses so we can get to the target area. And again, we do it really well. Uh, and we have a lot of fourth generation fighters in the United States Air Force uh, and also in our coalition partners. And this is actually one of the things we do in Red Flag. We package, our, we force package, and we exercise doing that. Um, this is you know, what we did in Desert Storm. Uh, and it worked out really well. Uh, but uh, there's a big focus on force packaging, suppressing the threats, and then formation integrity, keeping those formations together. With an F-35, you actually don't need that large force packaging because the threat rings get smaller, so you can go around the threats. So you may not need 70 or 80 aircraft in order just to get to one target area. The other neat thing about the F-35 is that it doesn't keep a secret from other aircraft. So when I'm flying the F-35, I get all of this information. I told you about that situational awareness of the battle space. But we also have data link systems where we data link to other aircraft. Uh, and one of those data links is called a Link 16 network. And I can actually Link 16 data that I have an F-35 to an F-16 or to an F-15 uh, to a F-A-18, for example, uh, from Canada, for example. Uh, so the F-35 can actually act as a quarterback when you're managing the battle space uh, for other fourth generation fighters. So it makes everyone better. Uh, and it's a huge part of integration uh, in, as we modernize our force. A good example is uh, a red flag exercise actually down in Nevada. 
uh, we had a very young F-35 pilot. He only had about 60 hours of flying time totally in the airplane. He's in red flag. He's like the most junior guy in the flight. And he is actually directing four ship flight leads and instructor pilots that fly F-16s to go out uh, because he had more situational awareness. So he's able to you know, make them more survivable. So it's really about a team sport. Air power is a team sport, not just for our, our US you know, pilots, but also our partners and allies. Uh, so there's a big focus on you know, avoiding threats, uh, lower um, uh, suppression of uh, air defense uh, requirements. Uh, and then also we look at nodal integrity, like using the F-35 almost as an information node uh, to, to get it out. So it's a pretty exciting time uh, as we get this new capability to bring it to the Air Force and also bring it to the skies of Alaska. Which kind of brings us to the next topic. So what are we going to do uh, with 54 F-35s really here at Isleson uh, and here in the skies of Alaska? Well. Like a wise man once said, you're going to fly them, right? <laughs> and we're going to fly them here in the skies of Alaska. Uh, and this slide is a big deal for the F-35 program. So I mentioned earlier that I was stationed down in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, for, I did two assignments there. Uh, and I flew in this airspace here. It's called the Nes uh, Nellis Test and Training Range, the NTTR. Uh, and it's a great training. This is where we do our other red flag exercises. This is where we do uh, operational test training, uh, et cetera. But you'll see when you compare it to where we are right now, so we're actually here in Fairbanks, and this is the airspace that we use uh, for our red flag Alaska. It's about the size of Ohio. Uh, and then it's actually, it's for our red flags, this is all connected. So um, on Monday, I was actually uh, flying up here, and then we had blue forces flying down here trying to start, uh, strike targets, and then on Tuesday I was down here flying to the north. Um, when you look at fifth generation integration in the advanced threats those revisionist powers have been investing in for the last two decades, this is the kind of airspace you need in order to execute those tactics, execute those plays. You need that, uh, that room. Uh, and you just can't do it down in the lower 48. Uh, so as we bring F-35s flying in this airspace, and they're not going to be flying alone, they're going to be flying with F-22s based down in Anchorage that fly in that same airspace, uh, and they're going to be flying in that you know, unique environment, it's going to be awesome. Um, so we, we talk about the Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex a lot. Uh, we call that the J-PARC, again, to use another military acronym. But this is kind of zoomed in uh, in that airspace, uh, that red flag airspace. Uh, this is Isleson Air Force Base right here. Uh, this is Fairbanks uh, International Airport. So it's great because we're right in the middle of the airspace. If you didn't notice, uh, Las Vegas was kind of far away from the uh, Nellis Test and Training Range. I had to fly about 15, 20 minutes to get to the airspace and 15, 20 minutes to get back. Uh, so that's gas that I can't use for training. I'm just, you know, going to and for, for, uh, from the training ground. What's great is here at Isleson, as an aggressor pilot, I can actually sit on the runway and then the controllers that are controlling the fight will actually tell me when to launch. And we'll be, we'll launch and we'll be right into the airspace, right into the fight. So it's very efficient in terms of using every um, pound of gas that we have in the aircraft uh, for that training mission. Uh, so it's awesome. The other awesome thing is we have surface to air missile systems, so training systems um, uh, that actually are used uh, to try to you know, shoot down in a simulated environment our, uh, our friendly aircraft, our blue aircraft as we would, uh, uh, would call it. Uh, so that is a, uh, a great resource. And we're looking to modernize those threats in order to keep pace with the uh, uh, evolving threats we see in other countries. We also have targets uh, that we can have uh, aircraft drop actual live weapons and heavyweight weapons. Uh, and we do that on a regular basis here. In fact, other units will come here from all the way across the, uh, the world. For example, from Japan and Korea. Uh, we have uh, units here in... Uh, uh, participating in Red Flag, and they actually, uh, the pilot showed up two weeks early in order to just drop bombs in these ranges. Uh, because we have yearly requirements as pilots, we have to exercise our trade, right? We have to drop live weapons and heavyweight weapons. But if you're stationed in Japan, you don't have the ranges to be able to do it because it's so densely populated. Uh, so that's another opportunity that uh, uh, aircraft have. And then finally, 
we have uh, F-16s uh, that are aggressor aircraft. So we are the professional adversary force. It's our job to be uh, replicate the threat, whatever country that may be. Uh, we, rep we get to know those th different threats, and we educate our blue pilots on what those threats are. And then we go out and we pretend to be the bad guys. So this is kind of the training ground uh, that we have. If you look at a professional football team, they have elite training resources and uh, elite training fields. And that's, that's the analogy to, to the fighter pilot. Uh, is that airspace there. So again, having the F-35 flying in that uh, is going to be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and it's going to be really the future of the, uh, of the aircraft. I kind of use the analogy flying the F-35 um, is, any football fans here? <laughs> yeah, maybe a few, maybe a few. Uh, so think of Tom Brady when he was a junior at Michigan. Excellent quarterback, very, very talented, and actually could have probably played on professional teams there and done really well. But in just a few years, like three to four years of maturing, he was an MVP, you know, Super Bowl MVP uh, quarterback. The F-35 is kind of like that right now. So it is a phenomenal capability. It's awesome. And if I had to go to combat tonight, I would rather be flying an F-35 than any other aircraft I've flown in my career. But what's really exciting is about three to four years, uh, when I was at Luke, I was training young F-35 pilots coming right out of pilot training. Those pilots are down at uh, Hill Air Force Base in Salt Lake, and they're becoming four ship flight leads, instructor pilots. They're coming here. And unlike me, I had 15 years of baggage of flying an F-15E. These young pilots, they're a clean slate. And they fly the aircraft totally different because they aren't encumbered by that, uh, that baggage. And they are the ones flying in that, this environment right here that's going to really inform the aircraft and the aircraft is going to grow up in the skies of Alaska is what I say. So it's pretty exciting. I actually get chills just thinking about it, like how awesome it's going to be uh, for the, these pilots flying in here and then also the community support that we have. So this is where we're going to fly them. This is what we're going to do with them. And then we're going to fly with our partners as well. Uh, so red flag exercises, already alluded to it, extremely popular. We train over 10,000 um, uh, airmen from all over the world each and every day. These are just some of the countries that we have. We talked about the UK and Canadians and uh, Australians being here uh, in this exercise. Uh, I hosted uh, uh, the Minister of Defense from Finland last October. So Finland a country that shares a 750 mile border with Russia came all the way across the globe to train here. And oh, by the way, the Minister of Defense, so the Secretary of Defense equivalent, brought his Chief of Defense Air Forces, uh, or excuse me, Chief of Defense of All Forces and his Chief of Staff of the Air Force with him uh, to come here. So uh, it, was a, it was a great opportunity. Yes, sir. A segue into that comment you just made about your junior grade pilot, mm -hmm. you know, Bad habits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard that this is the last airplane that we have a So the question was uh, kind of alluding to the advances in technology and aircraft. Uh, is the F 35 the last aircraft to have a pilot in it? Uh, maybe. Uh, I will say, as we look forward to technology evolving, uh, is having a man in the aircraft, is that necessarily you know, required? Uh, right now, the Air Force is actually doing a lot of research and development on that. And maybe it's a mix. Maybe you have one manned aircraft uh, with uh, unmanned area vehicles accompanying them. Uh, so I will say it's, uh, it's one of the areas that we're really looking at. And then how do you have remote, remotely piloted aircraft you know, be part of that? Uh, I will say uh, earlier in June, uh, we actually had uh, MQ-9s. Uh, which are uh, and remotely piloted aircraft uh, actually integrate into our red flag vols uh, because we're looking at how do you integrate that capability into an advanced environment uh, because those kind of uh, remotely piloted aircraft have been really focusing on operations in the Middle East and are low threat, but they have capabilities that are, are evolving. So it's a pretty exciting time. So did that answer your question? Yes, mm -hmm. yes ma'am. Yeah. How much, mm -hmm. how much time do you actually do flying versus how much you can do in a simulator? So I, the, had the, I had the mm -hmm. f uh, 
experience of flying the simulator, which mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but how much can they actually do of training versus live mm -hmm. percentage wise? So if you didn't hear, the question is, how much training do we do in the simulator environment versus actually in the air? Uh, in the, typically, the answer is, uh, for a young pilot, he has to fly, he or she has to fly nine times a month in order to keep our basic currency. Uh, and then they typically do about two, uh, two simulators a month as well. Although I see that rate increasing as we go forth. Uh, because what we're finding, in, when I was growing up uh, and learning to fly the F-15, is I did all my basic training in the simulator, like my basic instrument training, uh, training on how to handle emergency procedures. Uh, all that done was, was done in the sim. And I went out and did the advanced training in the air. But actually, when we get to the fifth generation aircraft, it's starting to turn on its head, where some of the most advanced training and demanding training we can only do in a virtual environment. Um, so a good example is the uh, F-22 uh, is a fifth generation aircraft, again stationed down in Anchorage, and we have our weapons school. Uh, so it's our top gun school for the Air Force. It's where we send the best you know, instructor pilots and they go and learn how to be the best instructors they possibly can. Uh, when you graduate, you get a patch that looks like this. Uh, so everyone knows who the uh, weapons officers and the graduates are. Uh, and it was interesting, when you talk to the F-22 uh, pilots, their most demanding phase isn't the flying part, it's actually the simulator part, uh, because that's where the system is uh, uh, really tasked. So as we're looking at uh, training, uh, and our simulator building is actually finished, and we're installing the simulators now, and they're going to start training in, in November, that's one of the areas that we're really focusing on, uh, is how do you bring the virtual environment. We actually bring that into our red flag exercises as well in order to provide the best training uh, live in version. So this is what the F-35 is going to do. It's going to be in that environment. It's going to have the opportunity to participate in red flag. Again, operationalizing our national defense strategy. Uh, but we're also going to fly it here. <laughs> so we're going to go on the road and we're going to deploy wherever in the globe that our Department of Defense needs us to in order to bring the F-35 you know, to, uh, uh, to different theaters. So, yes, sir. Just looking at mm -hmm. that map, yeah, you stated the importance of uh, Alaska to mm -hmm. Nielsen of the defense of the United States. Mm -hmm. Where does the rank instead of being a town in cases like Russia? Okay, so the, the question is where does Isleson rank on being a target uh, in terms of you know, what a, a threat country uh, might, like, uh, might look to, uh, to bring some resources and, uh, and uh, attack in a time of conflict? Uh, and I don't know exactly where uh, Russia would rank uh, Allison Air Force Base or Alaska in terms of a target, but what I can say is it's a very strategic location, and I would expect our adversaries will want to control that strategic location as well. So as a combat uh, you know, fighter wing commander, you know, we exercise regularly on how do we operate in a combat environment? How would we deploy forces forward? And then also, how would we defend our base and garrison as well? Uh, so we typically think of some sort of kinetic attack, like a you know weapon strike or a cruise missile strike. But also, also uh, when we you know kind of heard in the in the introduction a little bit, we train to be able to operate not just in the air environment, but also the cyber space environment. So we need to, uh, in the Air Force we talk about uh, operating and training in a contested cyber environment where our networks may be denied by a, de uh, a determined adversary. Also, space is becoming a war fighting domain. Uh, so how does space in that environment uh, provide as well? Uh, and then how do we train that environment prepare? So uh, right now I would say I have more questions than answers. Uh, uh, but it's important to ask these questions and then provide the environment where our airmen uh, from the United States and our uh, allies and partners can come together and tackle those difficult problems. So I hope that helps or answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. The it, it seems very apparent that you have excellence in, in more lethal force, mm -hmm. uh, in building partnerships, mm -hmm. uh, the technological innovation. Mm -hmm. The thing that, in, in the back of the minds of, of some, mm -hmm. including myself, is the, geo, the geopolitical, mm -hmm. the communication, the accidents that could happen from miscommunication, <laughs> misinterpretation, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. and, and how is that um, uh, avoided? Okay. So the kind of the question, if I, as a readback for the people in the back, is 
how, okay, we focus on a more lethal force, building alliances, but how do we avoid a misperception or a miscommunication in the geopolitical uh, environment? Uh, and I would say that's a big concern of mine as a wing commander. Uh, and the answer is you have a disciplined force. Yeah, we have very strict uh, rules of engagement of how we operate uh, to make sure our intentions are well known uh, and we're very strategically um, predictable. We want to be strategically predictable, but operationally and tactically unpredictable. Um, so, uh, because if we fly in the wrong airspace, for example, we can create an international incident. Uh, for those that are familiar with the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a U-2 in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis that inadvertently flew over the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, the Soviets thought that was a you know, direct challenge uh, in a direct violation of the airspace when really the story is the pilot just got lost. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, President Kennedy, you know, was reported to say, you know, somebody just didn't get the message. Uh, but that's obviously an extreme example, but it gets to your question is like, how do we make sure that we have this incredibly strategic force that it, uh, uh, is employed it directly in line with our national command authority? And I would assure you that the discipline that we have uh, and the command and control that uh, we focus on helps prevent that from, uh, uh, from happening. So when we do move aircraft or we do uh, do an operation, it's very deliberate and very disciplined. Does that same thing apply to the Russians, like when they try to fly their, their nuclear bombers like they did earlier? So the, the question is, does that apply to the Russians uh, in terms of how they fly th their routes? Uh, I will say I do not operate uh, the forces that intercept uh, those. Those are actually F-22s down in uh, 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 Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. Our tankers do support uh, those operations, uh, but so I can't attest to them personally. But what I can attest to is I know all those intercepts have been done in a very professional uh, manner, uh, and uh, you know it's part of the uh, the international environment that we're in. Um, and it used to be more common, like back in the Cold War day, but it's be, it's, uh, it seems to be very common right now. So. Yes, sir, in the back. Sir, what do you anticipate will be the average tour of duty for uh, F-35 pilots up here at Allison itself? Uh, I expect about three to four years. So three years is the standard assignment uh, for a pilot. Uh, there's opportunities to extend. Uh, if they're single, it may be one year, or excuse me, not one year, but two years. Uh, but typically the three-year tour is the average. And that's really what I averaged in, in my assignments until I uh, became a more senior in rank. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Do you care to speculate or elaborate if we may get new tankers at mm -hmm. Allison in support of the wing and, and Jaeger? Yep. So the question is will we get new tankers uh, in support of the wing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I will say that's the question the Air Force is asking right now. They're looking to put uh, our new KC 46 aircraft, uh, tanker aircraft, somewhere in the Pacific. Allison is one of the uh, locations they're looking at. Uh, personally, my opinion is I think. And for all the reasons, it'd be a great place to put a, a, a tanker unit. <laughs> but what would that do to increase even more? First of yes. All, right? So there would be uh, a necessary military construction or MILCON uh, cost associated with that. Again, that's not Air Force uh, position. That's just my kind of assessment. Uh, it uh, would require uh, more growth uh, for the base and the community. Uh, but. Uh, uh, absolutely. And do you replace the KC-135s? Do you just keep them there? Uh, I will say air-to-air uh, -air refuelers is one of the key enablers that we have in our Air Force. Uh, in fact, we're talking a lot about the J-PARC or that Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex and modernizing in that and turning that into a fifth generation center of excellence uh, because Alaska is going to have the highest concentration of fifth generation combat air power than anywhere in the Department of Defense on that range. It's gonna, like I said, it's going to be awesome. Um, so we're looking to modernize that range. But one of the things that we need to do in order to capitalize on that modernization for not just our unit station here, but for our um, U.S. You know, joint partners and, and, uh, our, and our allies, is we need the ability to have uh, tanker support to get aircraft here. Because as we know, it's a long way to get to Alaska. Uh, and uh, uh, those fighter aircraft need the uh, air refueling cap capability to get to here, uh, to here and then also from here. Yes, sir. The uh, <laughs> Turks are buying the advanced uh, surface air missile mm -hmm. system from Russia, very controversial. How vulnerable is your F-35 mm -hmm. to that system? And are there any advantages to a NATO ally having that system? 
So I can't comment on uh, vulnerabilities to the system because obviously that would be a classified environment. So I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Uh, but what I can say is that you know I've mentioned I mentioned we're we've been in a kind of an era of strategic atrophy uh, where we've been we can focus in on the Middle East, and I will say our you know potential adversaries, uh, and then countries like China and Russia, they've been investing in technology a lot because uh, they are you know they know the capabilities that stealth aircraft bring, uh, so they've been looking to evolve uh, their surface-to-air missile systems and also their aircraft. Uh, and we're in a strategic competition with them. That's it, it talks about it in our national defense strategy. Uh, so it is important for us to you know, understand those potential threats and then also uh, provide an environment where we can train against them, uh, not only in a U.S. environment, but also in a joint in a international environment. Uh, so it kind of gets after that red flag mission, uh, also the aggressive mission, that training mission that we, uh, we do here. You haven't talked about armament and so on. Could you talk a little about the F-35 versus the 22's placement in combat roles? Yes, sir. So kind of the question is the armament and what the F-35 does in terms of combat uh, mission. mission. Yep, mission. And then what's the F-22 doing combat mission? And I get a lot of questions, which, which is better, the F-22 or the F-35? And the answer is whatever aircraft I'm flying, right? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my boss is an F-22 pilot, so he says the F-22 is the best. And you know, as, uh, as a you know, former F-35 pilot, I, I have a tendency to disagree with him. <laughs> no. But the answer is that both the aircraft complement each other. It's kind of like saying, okay, what's more important, a star wide receiver or a star running back on a football team? Like, you need both. Uh, and the F-22 was designed as a fifth generation aircraft to be an air-to-air, -air, air superiority fighter. So it, its main job is to find other aircraft and shoot them down, need be, uh, in order to control the skies. Because uh, that is a core competency our Air Force brings. In fact, it was April of 1953. April 15, 1953, that was the last time a US soldier was killed from an enemy aircraft. So we've had over 50 years, plus years, of air superiority. Uh, and we can't take that for granted. Uh, so that's what the F-22 is really designed to, to bring in. Um, it's very similar to the F-15 role, uh, like the F-15 Eagle is the air superiority fighter, and the F-35 is a strike fighter. So it was designed, it has air-to-air -air capability, it's phenomenal. Uh, it's got advanced radar, it carries two, two internal air-to-air -air missiles, you can carry four if you need to, but it also could carry uh, weapons, uh, bombs, uh, and it has a electrical optical targeting system. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, a TV camera, like an uh, infrared TV camera that you can actually zoom in and find a target area. It can use its radar to find target areas. It has a laser designator to guide in a, uh, a bomb. So the F-22 doesn't have that laser designator. You can drop bombs from an F-22, but you can't actually guide them in. Um, they're guided by GPS um, uh, systems and coordinates. Uh, so that F-35 is like that strike fighter capability. So it brings those bombs to, uh, to the fight. And really to have a successful mission, you need, you need both of those. So the F-35 is similar to like the uh, multi-role fighter, uh, like, like the F-16 was a multi-role fighter. So F-16 and F-15 would complement each other. And the F-35, F-22 do the same thing. So, yes ma'am. What kind of a fail-safe system mm -hmm. does it have when basically it really flies itself, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're in there as a pilot, mm -hmm. but still it's, it does its thing. What if there's a malfunction mm -hmm. in the system, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what do you do if there's a malfunction in the system, especially for an aircraft that's, that basically flies itself? Um, so flying the aircraft, first of all, I have to say, it is a extremely easy aircraft to fly. Um, so it is, it's so, it, the flight control system is so well developed. Uh, you don't really have to think about flying. You, you just make it happen. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, but, you know, every machine is fallible, right? And things can break. Uh, and that's one of the things that we do, especially in the simulator, is we train for when systems break. Uh, so what happens if, you know, we have three major the, uh, computers in the aircraft? What happens if one of them malfunctions? What happens if two of them malfunction? That's actually one of the things that we have to figure out. Um, so it has one engine, right? Uh, so what happens if your engine fails or if there's an engine problem? So we actually practice you know, landing without an engine. Uh, we practice if you have a questionable engine, what do you do? Uh, 
Uh, and that goes back, not, that's not just an F-35 specific thing, but that's an F-16 and really any aircraft, any pilot will kind of attest, you actually have to you know, train and think about what are you gonna do when those contingencies arise. Um, I will say, uh, so far the aircraft has had a phenomenal safety you know, uh, record. Uh, it's, you know, we have had F-35s that have you know, crashed. Uh, tragically, we lost an F-35 pilot uh, from Japan, so that was a very sad, uh, a, a sad day uh, for all aviators. Um, but, you know, that's part of, you know, being in aviation. I don't say it's inherently dangerous. It is inherently unforgiving, though. Uh, so, again, it kind of goes to the, the discipline uh, part of being a, a fighter pilot, being an aviator, and being an airman. Even if you're not a pilot, just being associated in, in the military and in the Air Force. And then I will say we need discipline from our maintainers. We need discipline uh, from our civil engineers that are managing our airfield uh, because it all goes into one big weapon system. Our base is like a weapon system. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, we train to, to handle those contingencies. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. So, um, in looking at the population growth that the F-35s bring to the Fairbanks North Tower Borough and the targeted area for development mm -hmm. being in the North Pole, Badger, Salcha mm -hmm. area, um, the amount of people coming here in such a short period of time and the U.S. military's reliance on um, the public to provide that housing. Mm -hmm. We don't have the construction capacity to build that with our workforce that we have here in the interior and so it incentivizes outside construction to come up here. Mm -hmm. That area being one of the most geotechnically complicated areas to build in the Fairbanks North Star Borough having a significant presence of permafrost and wet areas. Um, I plan on living in Fairbanks for 40 years. Uh, I'm afraid of the potential future impact of a housing stock that grows dramatically with a lack of sensitivity to our specific conditions here in the Fairbanks area. Um, Historically, there have been um, military-private partnerships to develop that housing in a way that is suited for the area. And so my question is, is the U.S. military's standpoint of partnerships with communities, is that changing from uh, past sort of relationships um, uh, across the nation, or is that something specific to uh, IELTS and Air Force Base, um, and should I not be afraid? So that's a good question. So let me, let me try a read back, just so we can all hear it. So obviously, construction in Alaska is different. Construction in the Arctic environment is different. Uh, I, I mentioned kind of workforce uh, earlier and making, making sure that we have a qualified workforce uh, on the base. But I, I, that also applies for the growth in the construction. Uh, you want... Uh, if you're building in Alaska, you want a workforce that knows how to build in Alaska and account for permafrost. Uh, so how are we as an a, as a Air Force going to kind of make sure that happens uh, in, the, uh, in the local environment, is in kind of the local community? Is that, would you say that's a fair read back? Sure. Yeah, so that's, that's one of my concerns. Uh, uh, and frankly, I don't have the, the perfect answer right now. But I feel, especially with our civic leaders, and it's great because I have the mayor of the North Pole here, uh, I feel like we're having the right conversations now. Uh, and to me, it's most important to ask those questions and to see what the challenges are to get the teams together in order to, to work through it. Uh, so before, before I even came here, I talked to civic leaders from you know, across the, the Air Force and also across the country. And, you know, there was, a, um, there was an Air Force base in Canada, New Mexico, Clovis, New Mexico. It's a very remote assignment uh, for, for airmen, not a lot in Clovis, New Mexico. Um, and they didn't do any housing uh, planning when Special Operations Forces, Air Force Special Operations Command went in there. And there was a, uh, a, a large increase in the, uh, uh, the population. The, the housing market spiked because there was a shortage. Housing prices went up which brought a lot of outside investment, uh, a lot of speculative investment. They overbuilt, housing prices uh, fell. So I am concerned, I don't want that to happen here. 
right? Because that's good for no one. That's not, that's not good for airmen uh, to have to move every two or three years or you know, purchase a house. It's not good for our community as well. Uh, so we need to build more housing, especially in that, you know, uh, 99705 zip code, uh, if you will. Uh, but we need to make sure we're building the right houses, to your point. Uh, I, they need to be quality construction. Uh, and that's one of the challenges that actually the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, regional growth plan talks about is, you know, the fact that, you know, building in Alaska is different, especially if you just look at zoning uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, requirements uh, and uh, the, you know, the demands that, you know, the state and uh, county, and, or excuse me, borough puts on, uh, on builders. And that may not apply. I was going to say that the, the, the borough doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you, and that really concerns me from an airman's perspective because you know I get an assignment to Ileson. You know, one of the first first two things I do, my spouse really does, <laughs> is one, where are the kids going to school, and where are you going to live, and you start searching for houses. Uh, you know, when you because that's just you know when you're moving every three years to sort of your question earlier, that's one of the things you do, and if you don't, if you aren't educated about the market in Alaska. You could say, hey, this is a great house. Look at it, it's awesome. It's so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> wow, my gosh. And they get here and it doesn't have indoor plumbing, right? <laughs> uh, so obviously that's an extreme case, but it's also, hey, if you don't have the, the um, energy efficient house. Um, so again, from my perspective, uh, one of the recommendations was to set up a housing task force. Uh, so that is, yes, uh, yeah. Mayor, actually, do you want to talk to that? Or? I don't mind talking mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. You don't mind yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you the best I know of it. Mm -hmm. We do have We, we got a mic here for you, sir. Thank you, sir. I thought I had to take that voice. Mm -hmm. I had a command voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I never had to use my phone. But we did have a, uh, a task force. Part of that is through the uh, Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation as well. And, uh, and I'll tell you, to be very candid, that um, 40% of the homes we have in inventory right now, we had to tell General Boosie that we start that 40% of them are substandard. 40% mm -hmm. of the 40%? 40% of the current entire uh, Fairbanks North Star Borough that's on the market. inventory is considered substandard. That's on the market. It's on, yeah, it's there, period. And 40% is substandard. substandard. And, and it's probably not worth trying to go after. Now, my city, I have a building department, a utility department, public works department. So my director of city services, Bill Butler, made sure that anything that's built in the city limits of North Pole is built such a way that it is to our standard. That doesn't mean it's the best standard that we can have. The Interior Alaska Builders Association, who we go to, you know, I, I can't, I, I have the same concern you had, you know. Are we going to keep talking about it, do paralysis analysis, or are we going to come up with a real standard? But we don't have that standard, uh, I would say, across the areas outside of some of the cities. Uh, Luke, you're here in the audience. Um, the borough doesn't have that authority, does it? No, the bankers and financers sure do, though. Bankers and financers do. Um, the, the one person who has a, 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 a really good concern about that is um, Price for it because he built homes and he was a little upset when he went to have a home that he built that could use multiple types of energy and it was extremely efficient. And the bankers said, Well, you know what? We don't put that kind of value up. The women want to know does it have uh, marble uh, countertops? Does it have this and that? And not so much how well built it is and how fuel efficient and you know energy efficient. So somewhere we have to come to an idea of what we are going to require of people. But in my own city, I do know that, that I myself am a veteran, and I knew what it was like to be assigned somewhere. And even my director of city services does not want to find some family coming up here and finding out they have a substandard house they bought, even if it's brand new, that it wasn't built especially. Yeah, especially if it's brand new. And so we're pretty, persnickety about what we build in our hall, to say that much. But we have the authority to do that, too.
That good, I mean, that discussion there goes to my point. Uh, because me as an installation commander, I have a lot of authority on base. But, you know, not, you know, I don't have the authority, you know, off base. And, you know, I can't dictate, you know, uh, the houses that, are, you know, our airmen are going to buy. So that's why it's so important to have these conversations and educate uh, and get the word out, especially to the airmen and families that are moving here. So, sir, does that answer your question? Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Are the airmen and their families well educated about where they're coming and what to expect <laughs> and to, what to look for in their homes so that they're made aware? Because if they go for financing, for example, that isn't local financing, but say with Pentagon Federal Credit Union, which I know there's a many, many homes for the military, they may not be aware of what the real requirements are here to live efficiently and comfortably yes. together. So kind of the question is, are the airmen and their families that are moving here, are they educated? Do they know what the unique you know, environment is? What kind of house do you want to buy here and live in or rent? Um, uh, and the answer is, that's one of my concerns as well, is making sure that we're getting that information out and uh, educating them. The Air Force does have uh, a sponsor sponsorship program. Uh, it's actually an Air Force requirement. So when you get an assignment to a new base, you actually get a sponsor, a name of somebody at that base. And it's their responsibility to kind of reach out to you and give you information. So that's one of the things that's really, we're really big on Allison is that sponsorship, because that's the best way, just to talk to somebody who's living on base and knows, and then that person has access to information as well in order to kind of share it. Uh, so we're trying to do everything we can in order to get the, the word out, uh, and we're using social media, and we have you know, local families that have YouTube channels that talk we about living here. YouTube channel. And uh, it was put on by Summers in Alaska. It's like Summers Real Estate, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the same family, but it's not the ones that are in realty. And actually what it does is it shows them, I think I've identified at least 25 films, including you, yep. in there. And it tells them this is where you're coming to. This is a glimpse of what's available at Alston. This is what's available at Fairbanks. This is what's available in North Pole. And, and I think you've got some really good reviews, yeah. some good feedback to say, wow, I put in for that. I can't wait to get there. Because I know what it was like to be a sponsor, and I knew what it was like not to have a good sponsor. Mm -hmm. yep. So I want to be <laughs> yep. the, uh -huh. the Absolutely. sponsor. <laughs> so as a community, I want to say, you can always depend upon us to tell you what, what we are all about in our community so they can see this. And uh, I think I have at least two dozen videos now that are on YouTube right now that answer to that. Thank you. So actually, in, in, to build on that point is, um, it's kind of a segue, but it, it joins really, uh, really well. I think is you know in the Air Force, uh, people that wear these uh, these uniforms, flight suits, we're having trouble retaining them. We're having trouble retaining our pilots because uh, our economy is near full employment, uh, and the airlines are hiring, and the airlines pay a lot of money. So I spend a lot of my time on retention, retaining talent, because if you get a fully qualified F-35 pilot, an instructor that's been a weapons school, that's over $10 million of taxpayer dollars that are invested in that, you know, in that pilot. So we want to retain that the, uh, the best we can and de develop our sources. So I started hearing from you know, my, my peers and uh, friends of mine from Luke Air Force Base where we have F-35s and Hill Air Force Base where we have you know, F-35s, that uh, people were, weren't, didn't want to get assignments to Ileson because it was all misinformation. They, like, they don't want to move somewhere where you can't get fresh vegetables half the year, right? Uh, and where the schools are terrible and there's like nothing to do, right? Uh, because there, there's no F-35 pilots up here except for me. Uh, when the, we had A-10s and F-16s and we cycled people through, we had people that would volunteer to come up here. We had no problems uh, getting assignments. So we started hearing rumors like, yeah, if I get an uh, assignment to Ileson, I'm just going to go fly for the airlines. I'm just going to get out because my my spouse. So what we did in February, I actually went to Hill Air Force Base and I went to Luke Air Force Base and I brought some pilots with me, but more importantly, I brought some spouses. <laughs> and I brought a single pilot as well. 
and they told the story, and they told the story of being here in the community. And I was able to show you know, greatschools.org, I don't know if you know that website, uh, it ranks kind of the schools, and I was able to show, hey, the two school, like the middle school my daughter goes to is in, in nine, and the high school is in eight, because we airmen value education, like we're very technically uh, and well-educated, we spend a lot of, um, uh, money and education uh, for our you know, listed force and our officers. I guess maybe I'm an extreme case of that. Um, uh, but we value that for our children. And when Secretary Wilson was here a year ago, she said, when the Air Force makes basing decisions, we look at spousal employment, and we also look at the quality of schools. Uh, and that, you know, for example, that will go into the KC-46 decision. Uh, uh, those are uh, driving factors. Uh, so it was important to kind of tell that story. And it's great because I was easy, it was easy for me to say why you want to come here as an F-35 pilot, but to have a spouse saying, hey, this is why it's awesome to raise a family here uh, was, uh, was a powerful story. And they, it's the greatest place in the world. It's awesome. It's <laughs> fun. I, I see why people retire here. So it has challenges, right? Seasonal effective disorder, that's real. Like, but I can also buy the very best food here. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and you can grow great gardens too. I mean, it's been out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. This is uh, not really your area of expertise, but there's uh, housing that's some available right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're not going to build more. I just wondered if you have a feeling for what the average weight is now and what it's predicted to be in a year from now. Uh, are you talking about on base specifically for housing on base? Uh, specifically for housing on base. Uh, so we have about 985 units uh, on base. That doesn't include the single airman dorms. Um, uh, right now our occupancy rate is about 91% and that's actually a little bit lower uh, because uh, a year ago from that 985 uh, elements we had about 450 that were other eligible tenants. What that means is they weren't active duty Air Force families. Uh, so there's some civilians that was working on base that was, we just had room in, in our housing and it's a tiered system. Uh, Air National Guard, for example, is a lower tier than uh, active duty uh, airmen and families. Uh, so what we're seeing is um, for those lower tier other eligible tenants, they're not renewing leases, they're just kind of going month to month in order to increase some availability. But we're, that's, that's again one of those periods of transition. Uh, and they're also allowing those other eligible tenants if they want to get out of their lease and then move into, if they find a house like in North Pole, for example, that they want to move into, they're allowing that. So occupancy rates are a little bit lower, but that, what that helps is as we get that influx, and we heard about it earlier, like that spike, uh, they're trying to have availability in order to, to lower the wait list. Um, but I expect, you know, as that in, uh, increase comes in, about 85% of those airmen families will probably live off base, uh, and in particular, and then that uh, uh, North Pole, you know, Salcha, Badger area. So. Seven, or excuse me, nine nine seven oh five. Yes, sir. Red flag has always been famous within Fairbanks for mm -hmm. a couple decades or whatever. But it makes me think of that training, our airspace, and what we've worked on, and this uh, communities supported for a couple decades. Is there any counterpart? Not in the United States. There, there mm -hmm. isn't. But even worldwide. Mm -hmm. On the other side, anywhere, is there anybody that really can compare to the exercises you're offering dozens of countries that are our partners and allies? So, so kind of the question is, is there anything that compares to Red Flag Alaska and, you know, other areas of the world? My personal assessment is no, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it's the best training. Um, however, I will say that uh, a lot of our allies have great airspace as well. Uh, so I had a two-star general that was here from Canada. I had an office call uh, with them. And they have a huge training range outside the base of Cold Lake. Uh, they call it Maple Flag. It's very, uh, very similar to, to Red Flag. Um, but uh, they actually canceled their exercise this year. Uh, they send all their, we have Canadian F-18s on the ramp at Isleson right now. Uh, they come every year. Uh, and he was saying that the training here is just absolutely phenomenal. Because that was my first question. Hey, sir, do you have feedback? <laughs> feedback for me? Like, what can we do better? Because this is our mission. I'm really big on feedback. I'm really big on culture uh, and, and development. So I'm always looking for opportunities to learn. Uh, but he, he had nothing but positive things to say. So Cold Lake has it. Australians also. Uh, Australia's a big country. Um, and we have big airspace down there as well. In fact, our aggressors, we go on the road uh, in January. Uh, through March of most of the years and we'll go around the Pacific and provide training to our allies and partners. So uh, this past uh, March, for example, we went to Australia. Uh, 
And I was really concerned about you know, the discipline of our forces in Australia, so I thought, you know, I better go and personally oversee this operation. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to go to uh, Australia. Uh, and we supported one of their exercises. We supported actually their weapons school, which is their top tier. Uh, uh, exercise and they asked us to come across the globe because we as aggressors can provide that uh, opportunity. We brought 12 aircraft with us you know we flew like typically eight or nine a day uh, but what they really wanted wasn't just the aircraft it was what we call our MiG-1, our pilots. So we have like when you're the MiG-1 so you're the lead aggressor pilot in a vol, you're responsible for putting together the entire exercise scenario and providing that training. Um, so there was 80% of our aircraft and they had like 15 of their own but they wanted us to lead the whole thing because we have, that's our expertise. Um, so uh, we do go other places around the world and there are areas to, uh, to train but Again, they all come here because of the, as you alluded to, sir, this the, the level of uh, training that we can provide uh, in Red Flag Alaska, and also Red Flag uh, Nellis. Um, uh, uh, Thank you. Yes, so uh, when you have Red Flag friends come by, mm -hmm. and, and so are they staying on base, or are they mm -hmm. staying on up the economy, or are they, and how many would you say come through a year? Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So they stay on base, so we do have dorms. Uh, we have about a thousand rooms on base. Um, and a lot of those are contingency dorms where we actually you know, allow them to stay for, we wanna lower the cost or lower the barrier uh, for them to come in. Uh, but a lot of units will stay on base as well. I don't know the exact will break, or excuse me, they'll stay off base uh, in the local economy as well. Uh, that's sometimes a challenge because as we know in this summer, there's a lot of tourists, and the tourist economy is here big, so sometimes it's uh, challenging to find rooms, but we've been successful thus far. Um, uh, so, can you said that uh, there's a plan to fly over the Gulf of Alaska with some tentative instrumentation? What is that tentative instrumentation? Yes, so one of the questions is the airspace uh, over the Gulf of Alaska. Um, let me see. I think what you're talking about is this airspace right here. So we call that the GOA. Again, we have an acronym for everything, the Gulf of Alaska airspace. Uh, and that is not permanent airspace, but that is airspace we can activate. Uh, and we'll do that for large force exercises out over the water. A good example is we not only do northern flag exercises here, but sometimes we do US only exercises. Uh, one of those was Northern Edge uh, that we did in May. Uh, northern Edge was over 250 aircraft. We actually had a carrier strike group that came up uh, and was you know, parked uh, off the, the coast of Alaska. We actually activated that airspace. And by, we have instrumentation we can set up out there, so we'll put uh, uh, GPS pause on our aircraft so we can uh, track where we are. And that allows us to do real-time management of the scenario. So as we're practicing, you know, we don't shoot real weapons at each other, right? Because that would not be too good, right? Sure. <laughs> Uh, so what we do is we simulate those, those weapons engagements and then we have range training officers that figures out who's shooting who and then who would actually be killed or moved and you know, manage that scenario in order to get the best training that we can. Uh, so we have that instrumentation system to be able to do that. And then at the end, after we're done flying, it's to, to give you some perspective, so we'll start at 6 a.m. to brief and then we'll take off at 9.15, so there's about two and a half hours of planning. We'll fly for two and a half hours, we'll land, by the time you actually get out of your aircraft, shut down, fill out your maintenance forms, you sit down, you review your tapes, that's about an hour uh, after that. So you spend another hour reviewing your tapes and then you go into your pre-mass for about an hour, then you go into your mass debrief and that's usually about two, uh, two and two and a half hours. And then that mass debrief, you're actually playing those lines and you rec recreate everything that happened. Um, and you do, you know, validate, uh, uh, what happened and then based on that validation you figure out okay how'd you do did you survive did you die did you meet your objectives didn't you uh, then you do another hour debrief on what you can do better and what you can learn because uh, that's what it's all about is that debrief that's where you be actually become a more lethal force that's where you can actually get better so we really we put a lot of uh, demand on that so when you're doing a red flag it's a long day I mean it's 12 hours just 
you know, in that period alone, not to mention, you know, getting up and, you know, trying to get a workout in or and getting your meals in uh, between. So, uh, but that Gulf Alaska airspace is what we can use as well in order to get some training. So when we had that northern edge exercise, when we had that carrier strike group, we were able to use that uh, airspace and activate it. So, but it's a little bit uh, longer drive there. Uh, so we need, to, again, tanker support uh, to get to that airspace and able to, uh, to use it. But it is a great resource. Uh, and it gives us access to uh, the sea and subsea domain uh, as well for training. Yes, sir. Sorry. The map we just had, there was a little blue square. Is that over Delta? Sorry. Uh, the Delta? Yes, we fly over Delta. Like this one right there? Yes, so what we do is um, we call this the Delta Corridor. So this is the corridor, if you see my pointer there, that, uh, you know, that airways will do. And when we have four large force exercises a year, we'll actually close off that airspace um, in order to put these two airspaces together uh, in order to train. Uh, so that's why it's, you know, very, uh, it's, again, it's, it's such a world-class you know, piece of airspace because it brings those two, two together. And then also, uh, um, we have a lot of coordination with the uh, FAA uh, in making sure that uh, we use this uh, airspace, and, but we're good stewards of it, and we share it as well. Because uh, general aviation is, it's a big thing in Alaska, right? Uh, you know, we have over 250 communities that are only accessible by air. So it's one of the things we're very mindful of is uh, working with the FAA, the general aviation community. Also, uh, I talked about ranges and dropping live weapons. Well, when we're dropping live weapons, we don't want anyone on that range, right? Uh, so we uh, have those restricted areas. Uh, but some of those areas are really good moose hunting, too. <laughs> so that's another thing we, uh, we work on is deconflict uh, our, uh, uh, our moose hunting. So the Army actually owns the land. Uh, so we work a lot with uh, uh, the Fort Rain White leadership as well to coordinate our exercises in order to make sure we have compatible use of the airspace uh, and then also of the ground and the ranges. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you coming. Mm -hmm. And what do you see as the expansion for JPA? So the question is, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, I'm a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm, I, obviously, I'm very passionate about this, uh, this topic, and I love discussing it. Uh, the question was, what is the future of the expansion of a J-Park? Uh, I will say that's one of the things that we're looking to do. Uh, I will also say uh, that this airspace is actually 11% larger than it was a year ago. Uh, so we actually expanded it to the north. Uh, so I'm going to use my pointer here. Uh, we actually expanded it up to, to the north. And then this airspace down here to the south, uh, this is the airspace we use a lot with uh, training with F-22s. So F-22s will take, out of, uh, take off out of Anchorage, we'll take off out of uh, Fairbanks and we'll fight in the middle. This airspace right here uh, used to have a floor of 5,000 feet above the ground. Um, now we get that lowered down to 500 feet above the ground, which is phenomenal training for our F-22s. Uh, so uh, this is another story we tell, especially to those senior leaders that come to Alaska. Airspace in the lower 48 is not expanding like that in 11%. Um, but we want to make sure that, again, we're, we're doing it in a way uh, that uh, uh, is compatible with uh, the... Uh, you know, the state of Alaska and, uh, and, the, and the local communities. Yes, sir? I guess I was asking, mm -hmm. where are you looking at expanding? So what we're also looking to do is, I mentioned the, uh, this airspace here goes down to 500 uh, feet above the ground. Over the northern range, we're actually looking to uh, lower that uh, over the Alaskan range. That'll be phenomenal training. And then uh, right now, we're looking to maybe even expand further to the north, uh, and then also uh, perhaps down to the south. So the, uh, those conversations are happening uh, with the FAA. That's, that's not something that you do in you know, just a year or two. So it's was kind of long. Was that brought out in the recent ACMAC? I'm not sure if that was brought in the ACMAC or not. Okay. But I can follow up and uh, find out. I do know, we call that the, the lowering the airspace from 5,000 feet to 500 feet above. Well, I know about that's that. That's the FOX-1, right? Yeah. Uh, we call that the FOX-1 law. I'm just interested in whether ACMAC was I'm not sure. Okay. We can sort of follow up. Well, as a, as a uh, civilian pilot myself, mm -hmm. I've been concerned about 
and, and I, I don't know, I'm not super familiar with all the details, but it's a concern of what I've been hearing about their space that um, could uh, make it very difficult for pilots to go through um, physical paths to the Alaska mm -hmm. Ranch. Uh, so we could comment about that. So, so the that, question, you know, it's such a narrow yeah. area that the allows people in little planes like mm -hmm. us to get through the Alaska Range. So the question is, you know, is there airspace expansion that would restrict going through Isabel Pass? Right. And I'm not familiar with that uh, specific um, pass in the potential impact. Uh, but what I can say is uh, when we have discussions uh, with expanding airspace, uh, the impact of general aviation is one of the things that we uh, consider significantly. But we can follow up. I can have my public affairs uh, officer follow up with that one. Uh, if you like. Yeah, because I've been real worried about that yeah. because, you know, from Fairbanks, it's really the only way to get to a whole large part of the West mm -hmm. is through that pass. Absolutely, yeah, we follow up. Yes, sir. One more question. Mm -hmm. okay. I did just by Fred Meyer West. Mm -hmm. yep. And routinely, maybe once every few months, fighter jets go as if they're going to land at, at Fairbanks yep. International. Mm -hmm. They go really fast. It doesn't look like they land. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Okay. So the question is. <laughs> There's fighter jets that go fly into Fairbanks International, and they don't really land there. They just go up. Um, so did you see one of those aircraft in July, by chance? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That might have been me. Usually. Yeah. So you, what you probably may have saw is like one aircraft and then one kind of yeah. real close chasing it. Yeah. So what we do is every 18 months, I have to do an instrument check ride. Uh, and I have to, you know, there's a certified flight examiner that sees how I fly uh, and checks me out. So we do uh, an instrument qualification that just qualifies us to fly the aircraft and fly it in clouds and, you know, uh, like a standard FAA qualification. We also have a mission uh, check ride to make sure that we can employ the aircraft uh, to appropriate uh, degree standards. Because like I alluded to earlier, discipline, flight discipline is really important. And in our flight examiner's program, it's one of the you know, elite positions that we have. Uh, so in order to do an instrument check, uh, one of the training requirements is we have to go someplace where we don't go every day. Because uh, if you just fly at your home station and fly the approaches that you've done so many times, you're not really challenging yourself. So we have to go fly an off-station base. Um, typically, we don't land uh, because when you land, uh, you put a lot of wear and tear on the tires and on the, uh, the aircraft. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll fly down and we'll actually do a low approach, we call it. Uh, so we'll fly in, pretend like we're going to land. Sometimes we'll even fly the approach to its lowest minimums. Uh, and then you have to do misapproach. That's one of the things that we do. So a lot of times we'll go to Fairbanks, which is great but having the Fairbanks International is so close because it doesn't take a lot of gas for me to fly down there. Because otherwise I'd have to fly all the way down to Anchorage uh, and do the approach there. Uh, so that's typically what you'll see. Uh, other times we'll go there is if the weather you know, doesn't allow us to land at uh, Allison, we'll divert uh, to Fairbanks. Uh, and when the weather is bad here, a lot of times we'll carry gas. Uh, that's what I did on Tuesday. I had to carry gas in case I couldn't land at Allison to be able to fly over to, uh, to Fairbanks when we had an opportunity. Does that mean that we're going to have more of these people flying through Fairbanks International for their... <laughs> yep, for their instrument checks. So there will be... I will say that uh, one of the impacts is the operations at Ielsen are going to go up. So there, there's going to be more aircraft flying. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I understand that the net goals for the F-35 is considerably higher than the F-16. Is the community aware? <laughs> so the, the, the question was, the, the noise footprint of the F-35, is it significantly higher than the F-16? Um, is that true? Uh, yes and no. So, yes, the, F, uh, the F-35 engine produces 40,000 pounds of thrust. That's a lot. An F-16 engine produces about 23 to 24,000 pounds of thrust. So it's almost twice as powerful, but it's not twice as noisy. So it is loud. Uh, fighter aircraft are loud, especially if they're an afterburner. Um, I will say, though, that uh, as we're taking off, when I fly an F-16, I used afterburner, which means I'm 
you know, lighting the afterburner, pouring out gas out the back of the engine. That's igniting that gives you that big kick. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. It's really loud though, uh, but it also uses a lot of gas. So if I'm light enough, and uh, for example, if I don't have external fuel tanks, I'll take off a military power that isn't nearly as loud. The F-35, when, when I took off at Luke Air Force Base that had a 10,000 foot runway, we have a longer runway here, this is 14,500 feet. I, I see aircraft taking off out of Isleson is probably gonna be a mill power, because you don't need that full afterburner most of the time. We'll do it every now and then for uh, training, uh, or if we have a really heavy load, but typically, uh, especially in the wintertime, we'll, won't we'll have to use that afterburner, which is where you get most of the noise, uh, especially in our operations. Where so. do the numbers come from, 35, 22? Where do you guys get those numbers from? I think it's to confuse the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the F-34? <laughs> so, sir, I, I actually, I don't know where the numbers come from. That's a great question. Um, I do know that uh, you know if there was the YF-16, the YF-18, it was the you know YF-35, um, but uh, I don't know where the. Uh, uh, where the uh, comes from. You said we atrophied. You said we atrophied during the Middle East conflict. Did the F-35 catch us up to the Russians and Chinese, or are we ahead now technologically with the F-35? So that's a good question. Like, how do you compare it? Um, uh, I would say. The F-35 gives us the technical capability to maintain our air superiority. Uh, however, it's not the end-all be-all. We need to continue to invest in, in uh, research development. We were talking a little bit about advanced technology and how, like, how to re remotely piloted vehicles uh, and Thomas vehicles roll into it. Uh, so I would say, yes, I'm confident in the capability that we bring in order to you know, meet the uh, defense demands of our country. Uh, however, we can't be complacent. Uh, and like I said, we can't just assume that we're going to have air superiority because we've had it since, you know, 1953. We need to continue to invest uh, because we are in that strategic competition. Um, and there are potential adversaries that are looking to, you know, have superior military advantage. Maybe not necessarily to, you know, start a fight with us, but to have influence around the globe uh, and really change the international order because that, you know, military strength is, uh, is a way to, uh, to get that effect. But I will say, if we as airmen continue to look forward and continue to invest in the future, that's the best way to preserve you know, stability and peace and international order throughout the, throughout, throughout the globe. It's not just for, for us, but also our allies and partners. So, sorry, well, with that. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>